To some extent, it's unsettling. Um, you quickly get to view the court as the court as composed of these members, and it becomes kind of hard to think of it as, as involving anyone else. I suspect it's the way people look at their families. You know, this is the family. How could it you know, be different? But you do get new arrivals in both, the, both of those situations. It's a, uh, a tremendous sense of loss. Justice White uh, always used to say, when the court gets a new member, it changes everything, it changes everybody. Um, change, simple changes. We move the seats around. Uh, in the courtroom. Uh, their seats are by order of seniority, so there'll be a shift there. Uh, the same in the, uh, uh, in the conference room. But more fundamentally, uh, I think it can cause you to take a fresh look at how uh, things are decided. The new member is going to have a, a, a particular view about uh, uh, how issues should be addressed that may be very different from what we've, uh, uh, we've been following for some time. So it's an exciting part of uh, life at the court. It's a new court. Uh, when I was trying a jury case, it would be usually 12, uh, if a juror had to be replaced uh, because one was ill or something, I don't know, it was just a different dynamic. It was a different jury. And it's the same way here. This will be a very different court. And it's stressful for us because we so admire our colleagues. We wonder, oh, will it ever be the same? But I have great admiration for the system. The system works. It gives us the opportunity again to look at ourselves to make sure that we're doing it the right way uh, so that the new justice uh, will be able to um, take some instruction from our example if we are doing it the right way. And I'm sure a new justice can always uh, ask the question, well, what are, you, what are you doing this for? And then we have to think about whether or not uh, we should continue to do it. We've heard often in our discussions with the justices that the junior justice has special privileges and responsibilities <laughs> in the conference. Can you explain how that works? I don't think the junior justice has any special privileges, but the junior justice has two uh, duties. Um, the first and less onerous is to open the door in the conference. When we meet in the conference, there are no staff members present. Um, and occasionally someone will knock on the door it's the job of the junior justice to get up and answer the door. And usually it's somebody's glasses or a memo or something like that. And then the other duty is to keep the official vote of uh, grants of cert or a decision to hold a case. When we have a, a conference, we'll go through uh, a long list of cases and we'll vote on whether we're going to take the case or deny it or do something else. And it's the the junior justice's responsibility, again, since there are no staff present, to keep the official vote. And what about the way justices speak in conference? I understand it's seniority to the most junior, and is that an advantage or disadvantage? Well, I think it's a, it's a disadvantage to the junior justice because by the time he or she speaks, everybody else has, has spoken and voted. Um, so when I was the junior, uh, which has been up until now, by the time they got to me, I was either irrelevant or I was very important, depending on uh, how the vote had come out. So a new justice comes to this court, and they come to you, and they sit in your office and say, tell me what I should know about this court that'll make it a better experience. What do you tell them? I would say you will be surprised by the high level of collegiality here. This term, I think we divided five to four in almost one third of all the cases. One might get a false impression from that degree of disagreement. Justice Scalia once commented that in his early years on this court, there was no justice with whom he disagreed more often than Justice Brennan. And yet, Justice Scalia considered Justice Brennan his best friend on the court at that time, and he thought the feeling was reciprocated. The public wouldn't know that from reading an opinion by Brennan, a dissent by Scalia, or the other way around. But these were two men who genuinely liked each other and enjoyed each other's company. As far as the composition of the court, 
you're, cha you're bringing in a basically, and, and, and this word can be overused, you're bringing in a family member, and it changes the whole family. It's different. It's different today than what it was when I first got here. And I have to admit, you grow very fond of the court that you spent a long time on. There was a period there with um, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor. When we had gone, we had a long run together. And you get comfortable with that, and then it changes. And now it's changing again. Uh, so the institution, the nine's different. Your reaction's different. You get to learn each other. You have to start all over. People learn, the chemistry's different. I've often said, it's wonderful to be the first to do something, but I didn't want to be the last. If I didn't do a good job, it might have been the last. And indeed, when I retired, I was not replaced then by a woman, which gives one pause to think, oh, what did I do wrong that led to this? But I'm sure that uh, the future will show that we have other women serving on the court. It's hard to be the only woman on the court, which I experienced for about 10 years or so. And uh, in a population which these days produces at least 50% of law school graduates being women, it's realistic to think in terms of a, a number of women on the court, not just one. What I see every day in my job, which amazed me the first day, and continues to amaze me, is sitting up on the bench, I see in front of me people of every race, every religion, every nationality, every point of view imaginable. And we have 300 million people, probably have 900 million points of view. I mean, people in this country don't agree about a lot of things. And despite enormous disagreement, they've decided to resolve their differences under law. There were very few robes available. I didn't know anybody who made robes for women justices. And I think uh, most of what was available was something like a choir robe or an academic robe for, uh, often used for um, academic processions and graduations from universities. I think that was all that was available, and I just got whatever was available, put it on. Harder was a choice for a woman of a judicial collar. I remember that when I first sat on the court, I had a plain black robe that I had used in Arizona in the courtroom, and I brought that robe with me. It was very simple, and I did not have a judicial collar in those days in Arizona. I just put it on over whatever I was wearing. And I was given a note that had been written by someone sitting in the audience one day in the courtroom. And it said, Dear Justice O'Connor, I've been in the audience watching the court today, and I noticed that you did not have a judicial collar. Now, all your colleagues were wearing white shirt collars, and they showed under the robe. And you just looked like a washed out justice to me. What's happening here? And so I took that note to heart, and I thought, well, maybe I should try to find some kind of a white judicial collar of some kind that I could wear, because I didn't always have a white shirt under the robe. And uh, it was hard to find. Nobody in those days made judicial white collars for women, I discovered that the only places you could get them would be in England or France. This one, the robe is from England, but the collar is from Cape Town, Cape Town, South Africa. You know the standard robe is made for a man because it has a place for the shirt to show and the tie. So Sandra Day O'Connor and I thought it would be appropriate if we, um, we included it as part of 
of our robe something typical of a, of a woman. So I have many, many collars.